Good morning. Welcome to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Edmonton, Alberta. My name is Reverend Mark Chang. We will start with our Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For God has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in God's holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not fear to swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek the Lord, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. The Lord is the King of glory. Lord God, we come uh, gathered together from different places and at different time zones uh, to sit and listen to your stories in Scripture, stories that have been shared for generations, told around campfires, told from person to person, told on uh, people sit on their parents' laps, written down in uh, scrolls, written and passed on and faithfully transcribed until we receive it today. Stories that still inspire, stories that still motivate and challenge us. We pray that in this worship service that you will speak to us through your word, that we will find delight in these stories again. Amen. (laughs) <laughs> we have an exciting story for us today. This morning's scripture passage is full of sex and gore and palace intrigue. If it was a movie, it would be part historical period piece, part political drama, part psychological thriller, part horror film. It would definitely receive an R rating. So sensitive sensibilities be warned. This isn't going to be a story for everyone. But what I love most about it is how artistically crafted it is. It is rich in symbolism and allusions to other passages of scripture. This is a literary masterpiece in 15 verses. Normally in my sermon, I try to impart the lesson of the scripture passage. I'll talk about what it means for us now. There's lots of lessons to be learned from today's story, but I'm going to let you figure those out on your own. Today is just about enjoying a story from the Bible. My goal is to unpack this story and to give you some of the historical and literary background that modern readers would miss. Hopefully, you're going to love this story as much as I do. So what's the passage? It is from Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 29, the death of John the Baptist. I'm going to read it slowly and take it step by step. And I'm also going to assume that we have, hopefully, people watching today who know nothing about the Bible. So before we start, I need to introduce two people to you. The first is King Herod. Now, when I say Herod, you might think of Herod from the Christmas story. The three wise men follow a star. They stop at King Herod's palace to ask about the new king. Herod gets jealous and then orders the slaughter of every baby boy in the town of Bethlehem. That's not the Herod we're going to talk about today. That is Herod the Great. In today's story, we're going to be talking about his son, Herod Antipas. But I do want to take a second just to talk about who Herod the Great was. Herod the Great was the king of Judea under Roman control. They were a vassal state of Rome. There's very mixed reaction to Herod's reign, and it's hard to say whether or not he was a good or bad king. He did terrible things, but he also did some amazing things, like a huge renovation of the, uh, that expanded the second temple. When Jesus goes to the temple in Jerusalem, he is going to the temple that Herod built. 
Herod the Great was Jewish, but his heritage was mixed, and some felt that he wasn't really Jewish. Plus, he was in charge of collecting all the taxes for Rome, so anyone who dreamt of an independent Jewish state would have hated Herod. When Herod the Great died, the kingdom was divided between his sons. Oh, well, at least the sons that Herod hadn't murdered already. One son, Herod Antipas, was given the lands of Galilee and uh, Perea. Galilee is where the town of Nazareth is, as well as the Sea of Galilee, and this is where Jesus did most of his ministry and preaching. Herod Antipas was also a builder like his father, and he built the town of Tiberias on the shore of Lake Galilee, which he named after the emperor at the time, Tiberias. The other land that Herod Antipas controlled was Perea, which was on the eastern side of the Jordan River, uh, which is now where the modern country of Jordan is. It's the same Jordan River where John the Baptist was baptizing. So now John the Baptist. Uh, He was considered a uh, prophet. John the Baptist was cousin of Jesus, and he was kind of like a social justice activist. He spent a lot of his energy calling on people to repent, to change their ways, predicting a change in the political landscape. John the Baptist had a big following. In fact, at that time, he was a lot more famous than his cousin Jesus. When Jesus started his ministry, people were comparing Jesus with John, and saying that he's just like John, which they were excited by because John had been recently murdered. Okay, I've got got it ahead of myself there. Let's talk about that murder. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus just sent sent out uh, 12 of the disciples through the region of Galilee. Uh, They're preaching, baptizing, healing, and helping people, and they're causing a bit of a political ruckus while they're at it. Jesus is getting a name for himself, and now Herod Antipas has noticed I'm going to read from chapter 6, starting at verse 14. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah, and others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. (laughs) They give away the story even before it's told. John, whom I've beheaded, has been raised. Yep, Herod beheaded John. And the rest of this story is going to be a flashback. But before we get to it, notice the tone implied in Herod's statement. Everyone's debating who Jesus is, and Herod is like, I know who Jesus is. He's the ghost of John, returned from the dead to haunt me. Oh, this is Shakespearean in tone, eh? So let's find out how John got beheaded. I'll keep reading. And it's at verse 17. For John himself had sent men who arrest Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful to have your brother's wife. Hmm. So much history is being summarized in that one verse. John was arrested by Herod because John criticized Herod's marriage to Herodias. These are actual historical events. So much of the gospel, everything we know about Jesus, is really only recorded in the gospels. So from an academic perspective, it's hard to verify what actually happened. But here in this story, we are talking about historical events that we have a lot of outside information on. Josephus is the main historian we turn to, but there's other sources too. Herod Antipas divorced his wife in order to marry Herodias, who was already married to Herod's brother. Herodias, by the way, was also Herod's niece, and that's why she's named Herodias. They're all of the same family. According to the gospel, John is objecting to this because marrying your brother's wife is against Levitical law. But there's more going on than just religion. In order to marry Herodias, 
Herod divorced his current wife, who was the princess of Nabatea, which is in modern-day Saudi Arabia. The king of Nabatea is furious and declares war on Herod. This is a war that Herod's eventually going to lose, even after calling for help from Emperor Tiberius. We don't know at what point this story about John the Baptist happens. It's probably before the war with Nabatea, but political tensions were high. John the Baptist is not just criticizing Herod's marriage. He is undermining Herod's political support. This is why he's arrested, but not yet killed. Herod doesn't want to make John a martyr. Herodias, though, holds on to a grudge against John, and she doesn't care if it's political savvy or not to have John murdered. So, continuing at verse 19. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. Herodias wanted John killed, and she hated this prophet, wanted to snuff him out, which sounds a lot like some other people in the Bible, particularly Jezebel. In the Old Testament book of 1 Kings, there's this story of an evil queen named Jezebel. Jezebel is plotting against the prophet Elijah. Uh, Jezebel's death scene, by the way, is so dramatic. I can't get into it here, but involves her falling from a tower and then being eaten by stray dogs. Uh, you should look that one up. Jezebel is pretty famous. Readers of the Gospel of Mark would have picked up this comparison immediately. And if Herodias is being compared with Jezebel, then Herod is compared with Jezebel's husband, King Ahab. King Ahab is viewed as a dim-witted fool, a tool of his manipulative and evil wife. Yeah, misogyny abounds in these old stories. So here, the gospel writer is calling Herod an emasculated fool controlled by his wife. But there's even more going on here. If I were to sip this verse like a fine wine, I not only taste allusions to Jezebel and King Herod, but there's overtones here of Samuel and King Saul or Nathan and David or Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, hints of Maccabees and the prophets. There are lots of stories of prophets standing up to kings and the kings cautiously listening. The story of Herod and John fits that pattern. The question is, will John Herod listen to John? Let's find out at verse 21. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. There's a lot of Herods and Herodiases in this story, isn't there? It can be confusing. So before I go forward, let me give a clarification. The gospel passage here is missing a word, just one tiny word, of I, it should read the daughter of Herodias instead of his daughter Herodias. Sometimes that happens in the Bible. It's nothing to get distressed by. Other ancient an, uh, manuscripts do include that of. We don't know the name of Herodias' daughter, but the historian Josephus says that her name is Salome. Salome would be Herod's stepdaughter, but also his great niece, sort of. Salome does the dance of the seven veils here. I'll dance for you. It's very seductive. The phrase, the dance of the seven veils, comes from Oscar Wilde, actually. He made it up when he wrote his play Salome, which is based on this Bible story. Herodias' daughter dances for Herod at his grand birthday party, and Herod is so moved by it that he says to her, Ask me whatever you wish and I'll give it to you. 
And he repeats, whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you even half of my kingdom. That's the most important line of this whole story. Whatever you ask me, I'll give it to you even half of my kingdom. That seems weird to us. Why would you give half of your kingdom just for a dance? I couldn't imagine a dance good enough for that. But there's more going on here, too. Herod didn't make up that phrase. He is quoting from the book of Esther. Esther was a Jewish princess. She was so beautiful that her husband, King Ahasuerus, promises to give Esther whatever she wants, even to half of his kingdom. Esther takes that as an opportunity to ask for protection of the Jewish people, which is granted, and that becomes the holiday of Purim. Now, for a Jewish audience, this is a very famous story. It's as well known as Snow White would be to the rest of us. So when Herod says, I'll give you half of my kingdom, he is really telling his guests that Salome, his daughter, is as beautiful as Esther. They're acting out this story. Salome is supposed to respond the way that Esther does, and she should ask for the protection of the Jewish people. And then that would give Herod the opportunity to say, ah, such a request is granted. I will serve as king and protector of the Jews. And then everyone would applaud. That's what's supposed to happen. But there's a twist. Verse 24. She went out, and she said to her mother, What should I ask for? And she replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Ha <laughs> ha! Wow! This is so gruesome. It's not what was supposed to happen. This sweet little girl asks for John's head. What a twist. Herod is now stuck with this dilemma. Does he follow through with his promise, or does he lose face in front of his guests? Let's continue on. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard about it, they came, took his body, and laid it in a tomb. Herod did it. He chopped off John's head. In Oscar Wilde's version of this story, Salome kisses the uh, decapitated lips of John. Oh, so gross. Here, Herod thought his daughter was like Esther, and he saw himself as King Ahasuerus. But suddenly, this is a very different story. This is more like the story of Jephthah. Jephthah was a judge in the Old Testament who makes this foolish promise to God. He says, if I win this next battle, I will sacrifice the first thing that steps out of my front door. And then the first thing that greets Jephthah after he wins his battle is his daughter. Jephthah now has this horrible choice, uh, either break his promise to God or kill his daughter. Jephthah kills his daughter, which, to be clear, was the wrong thing to do. Jephthah is a religious fool. And in this gospel story, Herod is shown as a fool. Herod thought he was going to be the hero of the story, but he quickly finds out he's the villain. He could have stopped this. He could have said no. Maybe some people would have laughed at him, so what? But in his arrogance, he allows himself to be placed in this trap. He didn't want to be a fool in front of his guests that evening, but because of the gospel, he is remembered now as a fool throughout history. No one cares that he built the town of Tiberias. What we remember is how he killed John the Baptist, and later his role in the execution of Jesus. 
I mentioned earlier how Herod's marriage to Herodias sparked a war with the kingdom of Nabatea. Herod would lose that war. He lost the support of the next emperor, and eventually he lost his kingdom. He would be exiled to Spain, where history forgets him. If we were to sit down with Herod in his old age, I wonder how much he would remember John the Baptist. Maybe to him, this was just a crazy guy who thought he was a prophet and ended up dead after a particularly drunken party goes bad. Or maybe John haunts him. A face on a platter he sees every time the chef unveils a new dish. A mistake he regrets every time he sees a woman dance, a guilt he carries with him across the known world. I wonder. So, here is the story of Herod and John the Baptist. As I said earlier, I I don't have a point to make. There's lots of lessons to be drawn from this story. Don't make promises you can't keep. Don't stick to mistakes just because you spent a long time making them. Don't assume you're the hero of the story. Don't be afraid to say you were wrong. Don't marry your brother's wife and then lust after her daughter. Lots of lessons you could take away from it, but I'll let you draw your own conclusions. For me, this is a moment to just delight in the Bible, to see how rich it is, how scandalous and juicy, how artistic and well-crafted. There we have an entire R-rated movie in just 15 verses. It's never a dull moment when you have the word of God. Amen. Lord God, today we give thanks for these stories in Scripture, uh, stories that touch on, on our history as a people, stories that... Uh, can still challenge us today, stories that are sometimes just weird and delightful in their own ways. We pray for, uh, for ourselves as we read Scripture on our own uh, that you will continue to speak to us, but we pray for all those who might be picking up the Bible for the first time and exploring it as well. Uh, that they will come to see some of the richness and beauty in it as there. We pray today for all of those who are grieving, uh, those who have lost loved ones, uh, especially we pray for uh, Linda's sister-in-law, Rhonda, for Linda's brother. Uh, Pray for him as he uh, grieves and, and goes on this journey of grief. We pray for all of those who are uh, separated from loved ones because of uh, illness or travel or just circumstances in their lives. We pray for people who are going through rough times in their relationships, for those who might be separating, uh, for those who need extra strength and patience as they seek peace in their families. We pray for everyone affected by COVID, for those who work in the hospitals, uh, especially as they deal personally with the trauma that COVID has brought about for them, as they work through all the the stress that this past year uh, has placed on their shoulders. Uh, May you give them strength. We pray for Lisa, who is overcoming uh, uh, symptoms from the second shot. Uh, Give her health. Pray for everyone receiving a vaccine right now. Um, That vaccines will be rolled out quickly to places that need them most. We pray for everyone who is working, uh, especially those in positions where they are facing the public daily and might be worried about their own safety. And today we pray again um, about the residential schools, recognizing our own place uh, and role in that as the Presbyterian Church in Canada, asking for your forgiveness and your wisdom 
as we uh, seek new and healing relationships with indigenous communities. We pray all for all of those who are uh, re-traumatized by the uncovery of graves. Um, we pray for, uh, uh, for our governments and for the decisions we make as a community. Uh, may we make decisions that bring about more healing uh, to, to, to all those involved. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you. Uh, again, hopefully uh, in the coming weeks, uh, numbers of cases of COVID will remain low and we might look at reopening for now. I'm glad that you're joining me online and I look forward to seeing you next week. All right. God bless.